Welcome back to Questing Beast. I'm Ben. Today we're taking a look at Planar Compass, issue number one. So this is the one for summer 2020. This appears to be a, a new series of zines that's covering a planescape, well, more like a spell jammer ish universe. And that's pretty exciting because I love those types of planar uh, settings for Dungeons and Dragons. So it's nice to see a periodical coming out that's going to cover more information about that especially for more OSR and modern versions of these old school games. So uh, at the back here, it says the Big Black, the Sea of Souls, the Astral Realm. There are many names for the space between the plains. In the center of it all lies an island, the friendliest port in the plains. Whether you are a spirit that has been recently separated from your body or an adventurer traveling between worlds, chances are you'll be making a stop in Dreamhaven. So it says down here that it requires uh, old school essentials, core classic fantasy genre rules, and classic fantasy treasures books. Uh, but frankly, any uh, OSR rule set is probably going to do you just fine. Um, thanks especially should go out to some of our new supporters over on Patreon. If you're a recent supporter, stick around to the end of the video where I will be doing shout outs for recent patrons. So. Let's take a look at what we get in here. So this is issue one, version 1 1.2. Um, and all the text and design and all of the art is done by DM Wilson and Sarah Brunt. So that's really cool. So it's a pair of people working together to do the illustration and the art, which is always great because then you get more of a unified feel to how everything looks. Uh, the layout is quite good. You can tell it's definitely been inspired. It says down here, layout inspired by old school essentials by Necrotic Gnome, and it definitely shows. Things are very clean, very easy to read, well organized. Uh, we have uses of bolding and uh, bullet points here, which help break down the information into more digestible chunks. I think in some cases, especially in the adventures later on, uh, more of this could be used to break things up into smaller pieces that are a bit more digestible, um, but it definitely does a better job than quite a lot of adventures out there. So this is designed for low level play and uh, it has some advice for hacking it, uh, depending on how you want to tweak it or if your party is higher or lower level than expected. And uh, it's set on the Astral Sea. So this is the place between Dungeons and Dragons universes. Uh, the main ways you can get here is if you are on a Spelljammer type ship traveling between universes, or perhaps if you died or perhaps projected yourself onto the Astral Plane, you could arrive at Dream Dreamhaven, this port location. We have some species here that are native to Dreamhaven, including the um, Onauk, something like that. Uh, the Ald Helsi. The Belsoriso, furry humanoids are like raccoons, like a rocket raccoon from Guardians of the Galaxy kind of looks like. Uh, Skolga, skinny goblins with heads that look like deer skulls. Um, Chanicoids, these clockwork beings are found throughout the astral plane. And of course, humans. There are write-ups later on um, about these species if you want to play them. So we start off with island locations and characters. Now, as we, as I read through this earlier, it came to different you know, major locations like the Slipstream Bar, and it said to refer to the map of Dreamhaven, and I had a really hard time finding it. Turns out it was right the page before right here. Uh, my main complaint of the map is that it is really small and difficult to read. Uh, it's, it's pretty tiny, frankly. It's not much, uh, it's just a little bit smaller than what we see on the front cover. Um, if this is going to be used for game masters to help navigate and help you know explain to their players where things are relative to one another, it would be nice to have this map a lot larger. Uh, maybe in black and white and perhaps turn sideways so it takes up a whole page like this. That would be much more helpful, especially if it was near the beginning of the book. It, it would just be easier to uh, find it and use it. Uh, so we have our major locations, the docks with our locals, each of which has a very short write-up, which is nice and punchy, easy to uh, read and internalize, with some rumors, secrets, and hooks, along with actual stat blocks for some of the more major uh, NPCs that you might find. We have a bar with the same uh, structure. Guest rooms, the bazaar, a warehouse, a lighthouse, a customs house, a smithy, and then we get into the types of adventures that we find here. There's a couple of uh, pre-written adventures. Most of them are anywhere from, let's see how long this one is. This one is, well, actually there's some random tables here. So this one's more like six pages long. 
uh, maybe more like four or three if you don't count the stat blocks and the random tables. So not terribly long. A lot of these uh, more event-driven adventures I'm not a huge fan of just because the way that they're structured, it's very much in the style of uh, go to this place, have an encounter, and then players will discover this, which will lead them to this thing. And then if the players do this, then they go on to this thing. So there's a series of linked events that kind of require players to uh, play along and look for the next scene, uh, which is really not my style of play. I definitely prefer more location-based designs where you have just an environment that you're exploring and you're kind of making your own adventure there. Um, but there are a couple of these types of adventures. Some of them are quite short. So I think you could just sort of sprinkle them in there and it would have less of a railroading type effect because some of these are just, you know, two pages long. So just a couple of short events. You could even move them to different places on the island pretty easily. Uh, there's one OSR blog I really liked that had an interesting idea where it said, instead of doing a typical adventure structure where you have a series of events or scenes that are linked in time, what you can do is cut those up and just move them to different places. So players can experience them in different orders. And in a lot of cases that works really well and it gives more agency to the players which is kind of my preference. Um, however, we do have some adventures later on that are in fact location-based designs, and these are definitely more my style. Uh, so this is Deep Warren, it's a short little dungeon. And we have a, a map here. This map is much better than the one we saw previously, much easier to read uh, and um, just refer back to the uh, write-ups over here. So it's like a giant uh, hand if you look at it carefully, and that does play into things. Uh, so there is the possibility of major changes to Dreamhaven if you sort of uh, figure out what this hand actually is, where it came from, and um, perhaps bring it back to life. There's a portal to Hedgemazia, so a hedge maze dimension. I suppose you could sub in here something like the Gardens of Yin if you wanted a whole other module to just tack onto this. Uh, it does recommend that it's more for higher level players, though. Higher level NPCs. We have some great color art. Most of the art here is black and white, but there's some very uh, planar type illustrations here. And we get into some classes. So some of the classes include things like the uh, Althesi, the Astral Sailor, and there are some of these with uh, their own psionic powers. That seems to be the main twist here. Uh, you get a small number of psionic powers if you're in Aldhesi. These are short, pale, and slender fey demi-humans. They're like little space elves. Um, but there is a more psionic-based class later on that gets a lot more of these. At ninth level, they can construct a stronghold on an island in the Astral Sea. Astral creatures within a five-mile radius of the stronghold will become friendly to the Aldhesi. They may warn of intruders, carry messages and news, etc. In exchange for this friendship, the Aldhesi must protect the creatures from harm. An Aldhesi ruler may only hire Aldhesi mercenaries. Specialists and retainers of any race may be hired. Astral Sailor. So if you just want to be the type of crewman that sails the Astral Seas, it definitely has more of a thief feel to it in that there's a big list of skills here which use a combination of a d6 or a percentile dice that you roll on but all the skills are more seafaring or spacefaring themed. The Onauk, still not totally sure how to pronounce that. They're sort of like uh, ogres. And they have a little bit of sailing skills, but they have berserk special abilities too. So kind of a combination of maybe a little bit of thief and a little bit of uh, barbarian. At ninth level, they can purchase an astral ship for raiding, attracting 2d6 crewmen. First level fighters, astral sailors, or Onauk. Uh, these crewmen are loyal, uh, provided they continue to be paid their due shares. A successful captain may use this ship and followers to capture more ships and perhaps build a fleet. So this is a great uh, class if you want to be more of a pirate captain. We have the Scion, who gets lots of psionic powers, all the way up to 26 possible psionic powers. Those are listed later on in the book. And we start getting into how psionics work. And it's a fairly sophisticated system. Um, maybe a little too complicated for my taste, um, but not terribly hard to understand. It is spelled out in pretty clear terms here. You have a certain amount of psionic energy. 
uh, and there's ways of calculating that. Most of the psionic stuff is based on your wisdom, intelligence, and constitution. Those come into play in different ways. Uh, this energy can be recovered over time. You use this energy to cast psionic abilities. There's a contact rule where you need to make mental contact with other people a lot of times before you can use your powers on them. Uh, for most people, this is pretty straightforward. You just like say you're mentally contacting them, um, especially if they're low level, you just spend some energy to do it. But if they are opposed to you in some way, you can get into these psychic struggles where they can try and resist. Um, or you can use more mental attacks in order to make contact with them. Uh, so we have powers in combat. Only one standing power can be initiated per round with the following exceptions. Uh, you can maintain ongoing effects by just spending more and more power on them. And uh, some psionic powers have defense modes, which you can use to resist kinds of attacks. So down here, for example, it lists how this works. You have your five basic psychic attacks and five basic psychic defenses. And these have different bonuses and pluses depending on how they're matched up. So there's a little bit of a rock, paper, scissors thing going on here uh, where you're trying to use the right defense against the proper attack. And we have a list of psychic powers, quite a few of them, anywhere from astral projection to body weaponry. So you can do things like alter your body in different ways using your psychic powers, which seems a, not terribly psychic to me, um, but there's a lot of great mental abilities too, like dimension walking, uh, domination, so you can try and control people. You can ego whip, where you just like your will snaps out and it humiliates them. It, the target is left feeling insignificant. Um, ESP, hypnosis, basically all of the psychic abilities that you would um, expect. I know that uh, I've heard at least that psychic powers are somewhat uh, controversial in old school d and I've never totally understood why. I mean, it's basically magic powers. Maybe people don't like the point system as much. I've never really used them personally. Um, I don't really have any objection to them though. Precognition molecular uh, manipulation. Some of these are a little bit vague and probably rely more on DM rulings. For example, this one says, the psionic character can weaken a substance by moving its molecules around at the rate of two square inches per round. I'm not completely clear on what that means, right? Can weaken a substance? Like in what way exactly? And it can move molecules around at two inches. Is this just for like making holes in things? Is it for like very slow levitation? It's just maybe an example would be helpful there. Teleport, Thought Shield, Tower of Iron Will. And then we have the open gaming license at the end. And that's it. So a short little uh, location or a stop off if you're doing any sort of uh, planar adventures. It seems like it works quite well. At the very least, it has plenty of interesting uh, classes that you can use in any type of adventure between universes. It has a whole section on psionic abilities, which if you're into that, this is a great option. Um, and it has plenty of NPCs that you can use. Uh, so I will put links to the uh, where you can find this down in the description below as usual. And a quick shout out to some of our new patrons over on Patreon, including Dogleaf, Older Cloud, Wismet Getchitta, uh, Clement Plakalet, uh, James Hartman, Brian Oldfield, Orden Wells, Daiku Games, Licopeo, uh, Orc Smile, David Wax, Chris Silvis, and Ivar Framnez. Hopefully I've pronounced most people's names correctly. Uh, that's it for this video. Uh, thanks for watching, everybody, and I'll see you next time.